Hi guys and welcome to another video. In today's video we're going to take a close look at the Unraid array and what it's composed of and how it works. We will see how data is written and how the Unraid parity works. So let's get to it. So in this video, we're going to discuss all about the Unraid array. And we're going to look at the following things. One, the components of the array. Two, how data is stored on a hard disk. Three, the difference between an Unraid array and a traditional array. Four, how parity works in both single and dual configurations. And five, how the cache drive is used in Unraid. So firstly, let's look at what makes up an array in Unraid. An Unraid array can have up to three different parts. One, data disks. Now this is where all of the data is stored. Things such as movies, music, work data, you know, whatever you store on the array. Now the second part of an Unraid array are the parity disks. Now these don't store any data as such. What they store is the parity information and this information gives the data redundancy and it can be used to calculate what the data was on a hard drive should it ever happen to fail and then this data can be used to then rebuild the disk with all the data on it. In Unraid you can have either one or two parity drives and one parity drive will allow you to recover from the failure of one hard drive while two parity drives will allow you to recover from the failure of up to two data drives. And the third type of hard drive you'll find in an Unraid array is a cache drive. And this can be used to speed up writes to the main array. Data can be written to a cache drive first for speed, then later automatically moved to the protected array. So that is the three things that make up the Unraid array. But what is an array? Now I'm sure most of you watching this Will have heard of a RAID array before. But for those of you that haven't, it's been around for a long time, its roots going back as far as 25 years. And RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks, and whose purpose is about encoding the user's data in such a way that it can tolerate the failure of hardware without losing data. Now many people incorrectly consider the Unraid array to be the same as either a RAID 5 or a RAID 6 array. Now this is not true. There are of course similarities, but only in the fact of how many drives are needed for parity and the parity calculations that are used. The main difference being how the data and the parity information is actually stored on those disks. But before we get into that, Let's just go right back to basics, so we can more easily understand how everything works. Let's talk about how a hard drive actually stores its data. OK, so we all know that computers use binary, either a 0 or a 1. This is also true of how data is written to a disk. The data is written in a series of 1s and zeros, And yes, this is true whether it's a movie or a bank statement. It's made of ones and zeros. Well, if it's my bank statement, it would probably only be made of zeros. Well, no, anyway, seriously, you get the idea. The data stored on a hard drive is ones and zeros, no matter what the file contains. And so, there are two types of hard drives one, the traditional mechanical hard drive, an HDD, and this type will normally be used in an Unraid array for data and parity drives. And the second type is a solid state drive, an SSD, and this type is normally used in the array for a cache drive. In a mechanical drive, the part that stores the data is called a platter. And this is basically a round disc that's made of a non-metallic substance. And then this is covered with a really, really thin layer of a magnetic material. So, we've all heard that hard drives are magnetic media. But how does a magnet store data? Well, the data is stored digitally in the form of tiny magnetized areas on that platter, where each area represents a bit. Remember at school, 
when you're told magnets have two poles, a north and a south? Well, it's true, they do. And using this fact is how the hard drive can represent a one or a zero. For instance, as the platter is rotating, if the north pole arrives before the south, it is a one. And if the south pole arrives before the north, then it's a zero. OK, so you get that magnet bit now, but SSDs don't use magnets, so how do they store their ones and zeros? Well, SSDs work in a similar way in the fact that they store ones and zeros. They don't do it magnetically, but using transistors, arranged in a grid with columns and rows. If a chain of these resistors conducts current, then it has the value of 1. And if it doesn't conduct current, it's a 0. So whether the current is blocked or not to some transistors determines whether they are 1s or zeros. So now that we know how data is stored on the drive, let's have a look at the differences between how an unread array distributes its data compared to a standard array config. Well, with a single disk, all the ones and zeros that make up that file being written are written to the disk in its entirety, as it's the only place for the data to go. However, with a traditional RAID array, it's normally different. The ones and zeros that make up the file which is being written are striped across the hard drives by placing a part of the file on each drive of the array. This has both advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is, is it's far faster to read data as it's coming from multiple disks all at once. The disadvantage is, if one of the drives should fail, all data is lost on all drives. This is because for every file written on the array, if a disk is missing, then a part of the data for each file is also missing. For this reason, RAID adds parity to the mix, and this allows for data redundancy. So should a drive fail, it will allow for the data to be rebuilt. In RAID 5, it needs one extra drive for parity, and in RAID 6 it requires two. This is why people compare the unraid array to these raid levels due to the parity drives. However, again, just like the data being striped, in raid 5 or 6, parity information is also striped across the drives. Raid 5 and 6 is fine so long as only one or two drives fail because it can be rebuilt. But should another drive fail or fail whilst the array is being rebuilt, again, all data is lost from the whole array. So with this in mind, the unraid array goes about its data storage slightly differently. An unraid array doesn't stripe the data across the disks. It writes complete files to only one disk. A file is never split over multiple disks. So, should a drive fail, the most data that can be lost is minimised to only that disk. But in most cases, as Unraid has up to two parity drives, the failed disk can also be rebuilt. So, the advantages of Unraid not striping data in parity are the following. 1. Should rebuild prove to be impossible for the failed drive, we don't lose any data on the other drives which haven't failed. 2. Unlike RAID 5 or RAID 6, we can add extra drives to the array, expanding its capacity as and when we need it. And three, we can use different size drives in our array, they don't have to be all the same size. Now the disadvantages to not striping is we do lose speed in our array compared to a traditional array. But Unraid combats this with the use of a cache drive, which we'll discuss later. As well, even if the parity drive fails, that drive can be replaced and parity recalculated. So that brings us on nicely to the next topic, to explain how parity works. Let's talk about single parity first. Now let's take an array of three data disks and one parity disk. Now parity is calculated from a calculation that's made across all of the sectors of all of the disks. And obviously disks have many sectors, but for simplicity, we're just going to imagine one sector on each disk for this example. But obviously, the parity calculation is done for each and every sector on all of the disks. Now remember earlier, when we were talking about ones and zeros on the disk, 
Well, what Unraid does is it zeroes all of the disks when it formats them before it goes into the array. So it knows that all of the disks have a zero value on all of their sectors. So we'll represent this with a zero on the top of each hard drive. So now let's choose which of these drives will be the data drives and which one will be the parity drive. So let's have this one as a data drive, this one as a data drive, and this one is a data drive and the final one here will use this as a parity drive so let's swap this zero and put this zero on which says even on the top. Now we know we have either ones or zeros so one is an odd number and zero is considered an even number so I've marked the zero on the parity as even. Single drive parity is done using a calculation called XOR or XOR. How this works is the number of ones across the sectors of the drives is calculated. If this number is even, then it has even parity. It has an odd parity if the numbers of ones is odd. So let's demonstrate this simply with our one sector drive example. So the number of ones across our data disks is zero, and zero is an even number, so it means that our parity is also a zero and also even. So should the data on this disk here be a 1, let's add up the 1s on our data. We only have one 1, so that means it's odd, and our parity is odd. OK, so let's make the data on this drive a 1 as well. So now on the data drives we have a 1, 1 and a 0. So how many 1s do we have? We have two 1s, so that's even. So we have even parity now. OK, so now let's change the last drive to also be a 1. Now our data drives does 3 1s, so obviously 3 1s is also odd, so that means we're now going to have odd parity. And again, if we change this to a 0, we've got 2 1s, so we've got even parity again. So you can see how the parity data is written. But what happens if this drive here fails? How do we know what used to be on the drive? So once the new drive is put in, we can actually calculate what should be on here. So, we know when the drive failed that the parity was even. So let's add up how many 1s are in our data disks. We've got 1, 2. So 2 is even. So the data on this disk, it had to be a 0. Otherwise we wouldn't have had even parity. OK, so that's how the data calculation works in single parity for rebuilding a data drive. But if we want to add an extra drive to the array, that's really simple as well. Before a drive is added into the array in Unraid, Unraid will zero the drive. And so therefore, the zero on the drive doesn't affect the parity at all. So the parity doesn't change when an extra drive is added. So in this case here, the parity would still be even. So now let's look at the same, but starting from an odd parity. Again, adding a zero drive makes absolutely no difference because the parity stays the same and it's still odd. OK, so I think that demonstration looked a little bit like a dodgy card dealer in Las Vegas, but hopefully it got my point across. So that's how single parity works. Now in Unraid, we can actually have two parity drives. Now I've heard some people say that the second parity drive is just a mirrored copy of the first, so it's only good if the parity drive fails. Now this is not true. Dual parity will actually allow for two data drives to fail in the array and for it to be able to rebuild from that. Now the second parity drive doesn't use XOR parity calculation. It uses another more complex calculation based on Galois field algebra. So with this additional parity calculation on top of the first XOR parity calculation, two drive failures can be tolerated. Having this dual parity is especially useful for large arrays with multiple drives in it, as there is more chance of two drives failing. One critical time a drive can fail is during the rebuild process, so dual parity protects against this. But dual parity has another advantage as well. When it comes to rebuilds, encountering an unrecoverable read error, or a URE. Now, this type of error happens when reading data. On modern SATA disks, about once every 12 terabytes of data read, one of these errors can theoretically occur. 
with disks getting larger and larger and up to the size of 8 terabytes becoming more common, this is becoming more likely to happen during a rebuild. So what happens in Unraid during a rebuild if this error happens? Well luckily the rebuild doesn't just fail as it can in RAID 5. What happens in Unraid is in single parity configuration if an unrecoverable read error occurs preventing reconstruct of the target block the target block is not written to at all and an error message is written to the system log. So this would result in a missing part of the data a hole so to speak so the file at that position would be damaged. In dual parity configuration, however, there would have to be two or more disks with unrecoverable errors for this to happen. Also, in a dual parity, if just one other disk reports an unrecoverable read error, Unraid rebuilds both the disk and the target disk, the one being reconstructed, and writes to them both. So dual parity is going to help you not having any data gaps in a rebuild should you experience a URE during the process. OK, so that's how single and dual parity work in the Unraid array. We know we can recover from up to two disks failing, but we also know write speeds to any parity protected array are slower. So let's get back to the cache drive, the third component of the Unraid array. It is recommended that a cache drive is an SSD. This has the obvious speed advantage but also SSDs have no moving parts and they theoretically should not be so prone to failure. So it makes sense to have an SSD for the drive that will probably have some of the most use on the array. Now the cache drive isn't only used to speed up writes. It's also used by a lot of people for storing VM images and dockers. So should your cache drive fail, you would lose any VMs or dockers that you had stored there. So to protect against this, it makes sense to use a RAID 1 BTRF mirrored configuration. For more information on how to set this up, please see my video on installing a cache drive. OK, so that's how our arrays work in Unraid. So guys, I hope you enjoyed the video and found it interesting. And if you did, then please hit the like button. And if you want to see more videos from me, then please subscribe to the channel. Anyway guys, whatever you're up to for the rest of the day, I hope it's good and I'll catch you in the next video.